I'm Plumpy from WhatCulture.com, and this is The Pipe Bomb. On February the 8th, 1984, a Mexican man called Rodolfo Guzman Huerta passed away after a heart attack. Very few people could describe his face, only a handful of people knew his name, yet he was given one of the largest funerals in the history of Mexico. But then again, it wasn't really a man that was being buried that day. It was a mask, famous the country over. It was five decades of legendary tales. It was a Mexican hero. Had he lived, that man would have been 100 this year, and that man was El Santo. If there was a Mount Rushmore of Mexican art and culture, the faces would be maybe Guillermo del Toro, maybe Frida Kahlo, maybe Chespirito, but the most essential and recognizable face would be a wrestler in a simple silver mask. In Mexico, El Santo was the wrestler, in much the same way that in the US, Hulk Hogan is still the wrestler. But Santo was so much more. Hulk Hogan wasn't in a comic that lasted for 35 years. Hulk Hogan wasn't in more than 50 films. Hulk Hogan doesn't have any family members suing each other for the right to call themselves the grandson of Hulk Hogan. Without exaggeration, the closest approximation in America to the all-encompassing public awareness that was El Santo would be Superman. Now we've covered famous wrestlers you may not have heard of in the past with the pipe bomb, hashtag Toots Mons for WWE Hall of Fame 2018, and they don't come much more influential and important than one of the godfathers of Lucha Libre. Rodolfo Guzman Huerto was born on 23rd of September 1917. He was the fifth of seven children. El Santo's brothers Miguel and Jesus were also wrestlers, with Miguel going by the ring name Black Guzman. Black Guzman was known for his innovation and popularization of the head scissors technique, a cornerstone of modern Lucha Libre. He was also known for his dark skin, thus the name Black Guzman, despite might not being it's unfortunate. When you go back and look at the ring work of El Santo, which spanned again five f***ing decades, you might be perplexed as why this simple man with simple moves in a simple mask became a phenomenon. At least Hulk Hogan looked weird and cut fire promos to compensate for a standard moveset. What made this bog standard creator wrestler template into a cultural hero? Well, that's because you're looking at it from a modern mindset. Lucha Libre has been a proper thing for over a century. Wrestlers in masks are commonplace. It's the standard for Lucha gimmicks, the foundation upon which to build a more memorable character. Character. But to understand El Santo's appeal, you have to understand that he was, like Hulk Hogan was the figurehead when WWF rapidly expanded, he was the first proper Mexican superstar. El Santo became the face of the first proper Mexican promotion. Rodolfo began wrestling in the mid-1930s, trained primarily by his brother Black Guzman. <laughs> Rodolfo originally wrestled under Rudy Guzman as a heel, but never to any notoriety. See, at that time, people had been wrestling in Mexico for about 70 years, but it was always regional, much like the territories in the States, but without the technology or overall arching promotional structure to create any major cultural or commercial gains. That is what changed in the 30s, when promoter Salvador Luterov, who'd become known as the father of Lucha Libre, established a promotion in 1933 called Empresa Mexicana de Lucha Libre. That promotion still exists today, now known as CMLL, making it the longest-running active wrestling promotion in history. One year later, in 1934, with a wrestler in a black mask called El Enmascarado, translated as The Masked Man, yes, good, this is all on brand, Luterov introduced the mask concept to the crowds of Mexico City. City, and this elevated the form into a more simplistic but more mythical spectacle, literal superheroes brawling in real life. Ironically, the man playing El Enmascarado was American, not Mexican. There's just something about the 30s. Perhaps it was in reaction to grim austerity caused by global economic crashes. After all, dark and complicated times create a hunger for colorful simplicity, and in the 30s, so came the rise of the superhero. In 1938, Superman hit the newsstands, a garishly dressed, muscle-bound Adonis with a secret identity who committed physical feats of escapist wonder. In Mexico, they'd already been doing that for five years. With a home promotion and a crowd-baiting style, Salvador Luterov was still waiting for a defining star, someone who would carry the emergent circus on his back. That man would be Rodolfo Guzman Huerta. Attributing the idea for his legendary character from Alexander Dumas' The Man in the Iron Mask, he donned a silver mask, a superhero cape, and in 1942, El Santo, which translates as The Saint, made his debut, winning an eight-man battle royal. He was the right man in the right place at the right time, the 40s and 50s being Lucha Libre's golden age of popularity, and the mystique of El Santo played right into that. If there's one thing you can say El Santo did better than anyone else, it was protect his gimmick. No one knew his name until the day he died. He went everywhere in his mask, having specially made ones that allowed him to eat, and even fancy ones for formal occasions. Ooh, ambassador. This commitment to secrecy elevated Santo from man to legend. It wasn't like Terry Belia playing the character of Hulk Hogan who'd clock off work and become a normal man. He was 
El Santo, always. To stoke the fires, Lutroth would frequently promote him in matches where his mask was on the line, known as luchas de apuestas, translated as matches with wages. He would always win, but with every fight, the legend of who was under the El Santo mask grew. It's basically the ideological polar opposite of seeing feuding wrestlers wish each other a happy birthday on Twitter. Due to El Santo's longevity in the ring, he worked with some of the most legendary wrestlers in lucha history, including Caveman Galindo, Gory Guerrero, the patriarch of Los Guerreros, with whom he formed the legendary tag team La Pareja Atomica, the atomic pair. Also, he feuded with sometimes co-stars in film Mil Mascaros and Blue Demon. And oh gosh, I want to talk about his films. See, with the introduction to Mexico of each storytelling medium, El Santo capitalized as television Television took CMLL nationwide, Santo was at the forefront. In 1951, notable comics writer Jose Guadalupe Cruz produced a series of comics starring El Santo which ran uninterrupted for 35 years. This series had El Santo fighting witches, mummies, and at least on one occasion, the Four Horsemen. Not the Ric Flair Four Horsemen, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. That's a fair fight. With every step, El Santo's personality grew bigger and more dominant in the cultural mainstream. Until he wasn't just a heroic wrestler, he was simply a hero. Like Superman, through his moral constancy and simplicity becoming a breathing symbol for a certain set of American values, truth, justice, the American way and undies on the outside, so too El Santo came to be a Mexican national symbol for justice and decency, and also punching zombies. Let's get to that. You see, this was cemented by his film career. That is what really pushed him over the top to become a national treasure. Over nearly 25 years, he made over 50 films, and nearly all of them involved El Santo and sometime chums Mil Mas and Blue Demon turning up at a place and twatting a monster. Here are the names of some of his films. Santo vs. The Evil Brain. That was the first one. They get better. Santo vs. The Vampire Women. Santo in the Diabolical Axe. Santo vs. Frankenstein's Daughter. Santo vs. The Martian Invasion. Santo and Blue Demon vs. Dracula and the Wolfman. Classic tag team action there. Santo at the Border of Terror. And Santo in the Fury of the Karate Experts. These films are amazing, not only because they're cheaply made B-movies, but also you just see El Santo turning up with his silver mask on, asking the police, hey, what's wrong? They say, there are some zombies over there, and El Santo goes, all right then, I'll go and beat them up putting him in the camel clutch. He's brilliant. El Santo's brilliant. In September 1982, El Santo wrestled in a series of matches as something of a farewell tour after his body started to break down. He used the opportunity to give fans a final chance to see their hero rise above his foes and true to form in his last ever match, Santo and Gory Guerrero who came out of retirement for one last pairing as La Perea Atomica. Those two teamed with Hurricane Ramirez and El Solitario against El Sino, Negro Navarro, El Tejano, and one of Santo's biggest rivals, Pero Aguayo. El Santo left the ring after his last match triumphant. A year and a half later, in January 1984, El Santo made an appearance on a Mexican talk show where he partially removed his mask, showing his face in public for the first and only time. It was a symbolic way of saying goodbye to El Santo, and in disturbing timing, much like the ultimate warrior dying the day after his promo about hearts beating a final beat, Rodolfo Guzman Huerta died of a heart attack a week after that interview went out. For his funeral, the streets were sieged with thousands of people in the kind of reception reserved only for national treasures. Sure, other Mexican wrestlers were better in the ring, Eddie Guerrero's dad Gory for one, but no one achieved the godlike popularity of the saint. His is the kind of story that sometimes gets lost in a history of professional wrestling that's often written by WWE. So hey, why not share this around and try to catch one of his movies? They are really something. I'm Plumpy from WhatCulture.com, and that was the pipe bomb. Hello, I am Adam Pacitti, and I am fun. To prove how fun I am, I'm going to ask you a wrestling-based trivia question. Are you ready? Good. The DDT became famous for being the finishing move of which wrestler? The answer is Jake the Snake Roberts. That was fun. For more fun, buy the What Culture Wrestling Trivia Game. Available now at shop.whatculture.com.